So I would love to start the session by briefly kind of everyone summarizing what they thought was kind of like the most interesting part in terms of, um, in the sense of AI incorporations that is relevant um, to, their own, uh, to their own standpoint. So what's the main takeaway for you today? Tom, if you want to start, I'll pass you over the mic. <coughs> um, that we need to be thinking about uh, institutional innovation as, as much as we are thinking about uh, technological innovation. So I thought, uh, you know, Brewster had a, a good point about, uh, you know, what, what can we learn from history uh, with respect to the uh, cooperation and what's the role of the nonprofit in creating uh, the public goods that, that we uh, need to see in the, in the 21st century or uh, Mark's thoughts about, uh, you know, how do we leverage a, a more uh, decentralized approach uh, to problem solving. That the government is kind of a, a, a fuzzy big hammer and we have to be a little careful about how we wield it. Um, but I come from a, uh, a worldview that has .gov, .edu, .org, .com, .mil all having uh, valid roles. But let's keep each other in the right places. And how to deploy .gov in this area I think is a little puzzling. And I think that was some of Tom's point. Okay. Um, I'd like to pick up on the, the governance experimentation. Uh, in particular, uh, Brewster, at the end of his talk, uh, was talking about the, the blockchain sector uh, as a sector in which people are um, engaged in governance experiments. I think that's really important. So this is where uh, the, the thing I kept skipping over when I kept saying first approximation is there are lots of collective action pathologies when people are composed in large groups doing something. And um, the thing about for-profit and non-profit and, and this menu of choices is we've basically got this fixed menu of choices constructed by lawyers. None of the entrepreneurs can really understand what the choices mean. Uh, and most of all, it's just this fixed menu. Um, uh, whereas in the blockchain world, as people construct governance arrangements, uh, you basically have this ability to create govern novel governance arrangements, most of which will be fatal. Most mutations are fatal. So people create lots and lots of new experiments, some of whom will brilliantly succeed. Um, and a lot of what these governance arrangements are trying to do is find clever end runs around collective action pathologies. All right, thanks. I think to me it was um, th hearing the different types of arguments for corporations and then kind of feeling out who is positive and uh, or like who's optimistic and who is not and why is that so. So um, I was thinking that in terms of um, Bruce's talk, in terms of corporation, that was a rather pessimistic view on corporations as artificial general intelligences and the same held to for Peter for me. Um, and Marx and our approach that we bring forth is basically that, well, the, corp, uh, the, the super intelligences of civilization is a good one. It is already serving our interests sufficiently well that we should rather keep it and strengthen it rather than to replace it. And I was wondering why that is. Um, and I think that, you know, while corporations are definitely there to kind of serve the interests of their constituents, which are their stakeholders, they don't do so for the rest of civilization. Um, while super intelligence, that is a civilization, um, you know, certainly by enabling those decentralized interactions between its, its constituents, it does that kind of indirectly. So where I was initially not quite sure why, you know, there was there were different kind of like uh, attitudes toward the positive or negativeness or benevolence or malevolence of the different organizations, that became much clearer to me. When Brewster talked to me about a year ago <clears throat> about this, he said, I've written a poem, and I thought, what? <laughs> I've been thinking about it for that year, and it's become uh, a thing. And it's not just a thing, uh, you know, it's sort of opened up a certain number of cans of worms. And uh, uh, it's become a thing not just for me, but for a number of people at the center. And we, we are talking about this, and I'm, I'm just delighted. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's hard to pick one thing, but I'm just delighted that we're talking about it. So I actually realized that I would change the advice that I gave to um, Senator Tom 
uh, which was, you know, to, to start looking at limited liability because, as you guys pointed out, blockchain is already an experiment in unlimited liability. Um, so I'm not sure we need more of them. That's fine. It seems good. It seems like enough. Um, my other big takeaway was um, I already came up with some solutions, I thought. You know, that's the fun part about talking about problems for me is coming up with solutions to them. Um, but I thought you guys raised a few uh, particular issues which I, I don't think I'd considered deeply enough. Um, one of the first ones was that when you're when you come up with a solution to any of this stuff, you have to break something small. Because if you're saying uh, my solution is going to break like the entire American economy, um, you're going to have adoption problems, for example. Um, because first off, there's a lot of people who will be very mad at you. And second, you can't even get enough on board to, to override them. Um, another consideration is that is that when you're coming up with solutions to this, you have to avoid a scenario where um, you have a bunch of different competing people who will all race to the bottom. Uh, when you're talking about artificial intelligence safeguards, for example, if you say we came up with a safeguard and it's still competitive, other people are going to be like, well, what if we don't have safeguards, though? Is that competitive? I don't know. Let me try it, right? And that's another race to the bottom scenario, just like the one that caused limited liability to take off among the states. Um, so those are both... Um, areas that I hadn't thought about very much. And the final one is, is national security concerns because um, I think that, you know, if we're talking about international arms races, if we're talking about assets only in the hands of some and not others, and if we're talking about nuclear options, well, we're already into national security, so we might as well point it out to everybody and, and realize that, that this is going to come up. That you need, if you're going to come up with an international solution, you're going to have to build some sort of cooperative framework because it's a national security issue. They don't just solve themselves. That's why they, you know, the military industrial complex is, is so prevalent. And so um, those are my three big takeaways that, that any solutions on uh, either artificial intelligence or corporations are going to have to deal with uh, things that are already pretty good, um, as Pinker pointed out. Um, pretty often that things are actually going quite well. So don't break everything. Um, that, that there's going to be a race to the bottom and you have to figure out some way to raise the bottom. Um, and that these are national security topics. So if you're going to talk internationally, honestly, I think you're probably going to have to have this sort of window of disaster uh, that you were talking about, Tom. For example, if some like small company destroyed its entire economy with AI, I think you might be able to talk internationally about some sort of safeguard, but even in that situation, it would be a national security issue. People would be looking to weaponize it. And so with those concerns in mind, you know, a lot of the solutions that I had are just, they're not as great as I thought. Um, they could definitely use some work, uh, but that was my big takeaway. It's, it's really good, actually. Um, it's important for me. I like having like concrete next action steps. So um, thank you guys all for contributing to that. Um, does anyone here have like an, a comment to any of the other speakers? I also like uh, Stuart Russell's analogy of civil engineering. Mm -hmm. So you never hear a civil engineer say, I work on <laughs> safe bridges. Uh, because you don't have to say that. That, that kind of like the definition I'm of, of a bridge is that it's going to be safe. Um, and so I, I think that uh, trying to create that as a norm within computer science as the technology that they've been developing both in academia and, and industry and in civil society has become more important and the stakes are higher. Uh, trying to create that as, as a norm, uh, I, I think, and as part of the professional identity of computer scientists, software engineers, and the people who manage them, I think, would, would be a good thing. Yeah, I think that would actually be a really great step um, if people were just thinking, you know, in terms of like a civil engineer, you're just thinking in terms of, of what could the possible public downside of this thing I'm building be. You know, like that's, I think, where it comes from in civil engineers is you don't build a bridge that might fall down because it's not your bridge. It's, it's everyone's bridge, it's the public's bridge, it's civil engineering, right? And so when you tell like an AI safety researcher that, that what they're working on is going to affect a, a lot of people, you know, this algorithm that you're building uh, is going to be out there in the wild, um, 
I think you could just call it like civil software engineering or something, and they might start to get it, but it would still, it would, I'm not sure that all engineering like started out as civil engineering either. I think people just built bridges for a long time, and I think we have to avoid that here. You know, people built bridges, and then eventually they did build safe bridges, and then they stopped calling them safe bridges because it was suspicious. So it's a process, maybe, but maybe one we should also be trying to head off. Yeah, what are some other, you've mentioned like a pretty concrete action item there, like installing this kind of like mindset of um, of this more civic responsibility attitude. Did you have any kind of like specific takeaways in terms of like actionable items um, that one might do? Uh, the area of, of AI weaponized um, cyber attacks, um, kind of basically greeting like an internet archive, which is a popular website, um, where we basically will throw bodies at it, and it feels a little bit like having the Polish army hit, you know, with cavalry uh, on horses against the um, the Germans uh, repeating machine guns. Um, but then, okay, so that that's frightening enough. But let's take it to a different place, which is cyber attacks that aren't just going to try to break into your machines, but say are trying to play games really fast against each other. And I think of the original sin of the web is advertising. And that that was playing out during the 1990s and basically got kind of weaponized during the 2000s, where you basically have, um, I don't know if they're AIs, but there's certainly adaptive programs going and bidding for different words and different ad networks. And there's this whole sort of cat and mouse back and forth about this. And I, I think of the big problem that's going on now with Facebook and Twitter being gamed by, um, say, Russia um, in terms of going and poisoning the social, so not as in the ad area, but in the people area, um, that that is now gotten kind of weaponized. But they're just applying some of the tools and techniques that we've used to try to convince people to buy crap to go and have them vote for people or be scared of certain things. And so we're starting to see these technologies deployed now. And some of the big issue that we're dealing with now is how can we harden our systems? Or can we like avoid hardening our systems against state level attacks? Um, can we get our states to not attack our systems? Um, and I don't know if we can do that. Um, but. You frighten me a little bit, um, but it's, maybe it's already in play, and it's some of what we're seeing now uh, that's going on that's that's dicking around with our democracy. I actually uh, I wrote a, a brief paper on how A/B testing is uh, human subject experimentation, uh, but then I ran it past my normal editing crew, and they pointed out that that's not illegal in business, and I was like. That seems strange. So in business, you can just run whatever psychology experiments you want. But if you were like an academic trying to do the same thing, you'd be put up in front of an ethics review board like immediately. And if you did it without it, you'd be censured. You'd never get a grant again. But as long as you're doing it for profit, you're fine. I talked to the head of computer science at, Corn uh, at Cornell University a number of years ago, and he said, yeah, it's very difficult to do the types of computer science experiments and, and development they want to do because it all involves leveraging lots and lots of people and they've got to go through their uh, their lawyer structures and their lawyer structures are tend to be more conservative than Silicon Valley um, startups Much more so, yeah. so yeah it's it's there's there's a lot to that I want to say a little bit about being frightened I've been living with these nightmares for a very very long time uh, I expected things to be as dangerous as they are now and I expect things I expect it to be very hard um, uh, to get from here to a safe place. Um, uh, but I want to caution um, against letting fear lead to despair. Um, there's an analogy that I heard from David Friedman that I, many years ago that I took to heart and, and uh, puts a lot of energy into what I'm doing, uh, which is we're very uncertain about the world. The, the world um, differs from the way we think about it in all sorts of ways. You can think of this as there's a whole bunch of different variables whose settings we don't know. And for one large space of settings of those variables, the self-corrective feedback loops of uh, the world are so great that no matter what we do individually, things will turn out well. 
Um, there is a whole other probability mass of possible settings of the variables where no matter what we do, it's all going to shit and we're all going to die. And it doesn't matter how big the probability mass is on both of those sides and how narrow the, the, the space between them is. When the question is not what will happen, but what should we do, the right, and the right approach is triage. The, 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 the scenarios where what we do makes a difference are the ones we should focus on when we're trying to figure out what to do. That's a good hopeful note. Yeah, that fits fairly well with um, the reason why I started the website Existential Hope is because working in risk research makes you almost certain that we won't make it through the century, right? And then you look at the historic evidence and, and we always have co somehow come out okay. Um, so I, I know, of course, and it's it's an anthropic un reasoning, of course, but um, my my main focus with existential hope was to not glide into existential dis despair, um, but to have like a cautious optimism. Not say, oh, we're we're going to race to towards utopia now, but to have like kind of like um, just a stepping stone of reminding us ourselves again, like what's at the end of the line if we actually manage to to make it out okay, and why we should really try to do that. Um, I think actionable items that came out this for me were one: the cybersecurity matter is one that is fundamental to to most of the others, but I think that was one that I agreed to prior to. But um, another one is that really the, the kind of incentive settings and the institution building um, is something that we should focus on in any case. Whether we are right and civilization is the right superintelligence or whether it's corporations, in the correct building of institutions and the right incentive setting in those institutions is always helpful. Um, and is always help, is also helpful if we want to avoid races, right? It is helpful in any way, and I think it's something that we can work on, and that is a problem that is not technical in the sense that only computer scientists can work on it, but we can all work on it, and we all have a, have a role to play here. So, yeah, that would be my takeaway. I think I'd like to invite a few of you to our center and <laughs> bring you together with a number of the people in, in uh, uh, political economy and uh, uh, law and see what happens and turn that into more action items. Great, that's definitely an action item. That's great. <laughs> um, my action items are first off to go through all the papers I wrote that are wrong now uh, because of all the stuff you guys said that's really good. Um, things like why does this matter not having been answered by my earlier statements that's good I need to know that I thought I thought I had pretty good answers to that um, but I think that it's it's really important for me to recognize that that um, we need even more discourse from a from an even wider range of diverse interests to really get to the heart of these issues um, that if we're going to like even not not solve but even uh, concretely address the issues uh, regarding corporations and artificial intelligences, uh, then we need to have a pretty wide group of interests. I mean, uh, a technical solution is really difficult to deploy without people working on incentive structures and and without people who are currently building good things involved. Then we have a pretty good chance of shooting ourselves in the foot. Uh, e either internationally or even just uh, in in the coming future, um, and so uh, I'm I'm really glad that we had uh, our AI safety experts Allison and Mark here uh, also to present uh, like a technical aspect to this sort of thing. Uh, for me, I, I've always found a lot of really valuable information from reading through AI alignment papers when I'm working in corporate governance issues. Um, the reason being, it, it has always seemed to me as though they're working on the exact same issues. Um, but I, I find it really interesting being here with, with you guys, all the nuance that I had not considered from uh, Mark, Brewster, uh, Tom, actually all of you, all of you. Uh, presented really good points. Um, Allison, your overview also gave me some really good uh, thoughts to go forward on how to approach AI safety. I'm, I'm going to be honest, you you raised a bunch of stuff that I'd forgot uh, in AI safety and I need to go read a bunch of papers again. Uh, so I guess my, my concrete action steps are uh, read through all my papers and talk to you guys some more. Um, so that's, I mean, it's as far as concrete goes, I'm not building a wall, but it's pretty good. I think it's workable. Well, um, I think 
it would be interesting to quickly talk about, um, you know, would it be useful to have another one of those events or should there rather be more research being done now? Um, and if so, who should be here? And um, if anyone in the audience knows of someone that should have been here today that wasn't here, who has written or thought about those types of issues, those like broader definitions of intelligence, um, then please shout out names. Um, but uh, does anyone think it should, yeah, does anyone have a concrete idea of, you know, what force I could be doing in, in this regard in the future? Well, I may just say that since I, I focus so much of my um, argument up as opposed to the positions of Yudkowsky and Bostrom, I felt weird doing that in a forum where they weren't here to answer. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so for future gatherings like this, especially if I'm going to make these arguments again, I'd very much like the opposition of those arguments to be. Yeah. In case be, you're hearing this, this is an invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be really great if they didn't live on different continents, you know? Yeah, uh, we, we are working on, on that. <laughs> on that too. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that the, the fact that Bostrom uh, and his superintelligence work uh, sets the tone for so many of these discussions right now. Um, I think in part because of its accessibility, um, I think I think that a lot of those ideas, and, and he cites sources uh, prolifically in his book. Um, but I think the fact that that you know it's it's New York Times bestseller, right? I think, and and it's really uh, accessible means that if any of you are looking to to think about these topics in any more depth, if I had to recommend like a single book, I'd probably do that one. Um, but in terms of answering your question, Allison, as to as to what foresight can do and whether. Uh, like this sort of a forum is probably the best way forward. I really think that this is great um, to get a bunch of different perspectives on the table. In a research paper, I often feel like there's a desire to come to a consensus before you publish, um, as opposed to a desire to just say what you think is most important and then let the facts sort of hash themselves out in public. Um, and that's why I, I really enjoyed this, uh, because I feel like you know, if, if we'd all just talked about this in private and then published our findings, we would have lost a lot of the really valuable, just, just weird personal perspectives on these issues um, that, that might inform really valuable research areas going forward. I thought this was a terrific gathering because people were willing to ask the, are we even talking about anything real here? <laughs> that, um, that, and to try to actually come together to figure something out so there's actually more of a conversation than presentation, hopefully. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty encouraged um, by actually a, a, a bunch of, of things. My, my wife slammed the door of her car, Prius, and she said, dumb car, dumb car. I don't want a dumb car, I want a smart car. And it's just done something stupid. And there was just sort of this expectation that things are going to get better, and they are. I mean, I, I'm not sure I could really live without Google Maps. Um, just, just the whole idea of, of uh, Google search, right? I mean, uh, these things are just freaking magic. Um, and we're building along uh, uh, not only uh, actually an intellectual plateau that's, that's, that's always seems like it's going up. We're actually doing pretty well with some of these technologies. And we have to go and watch over them. And fortunately, we're within a hundred miles of people that are really doing interesting things. There's a, there was a talk by Chris, I think it's Shroud, um, at the last Chaos Communications um, uh, conference that was uh, on, in uh, Christmas time that was about this subject that's absolutely seminal. Highly recommend watching his video um, that took this sort of, okay, yes, uh, corporations uh, and AIs are, are, are very matched, and he really ran with it. And Danny Hillis, uh, one of my mentors um, is publishing a, a chapter in a book that's coming out in a few months on this subject. So there's other people thinking in this area, hopefully productively. Whether there's a reason to get together again, I don't know. But uh, I, I found this tremendous, and, and uh, thank you all for coming. Let's <clears throat> check the collective intelligence. You guys think we should do this again? <laughs> well, we have, we have even more confirmation by it.